Alrighty, what, what's up? We're, we're, we're short. We don't have enough. I'm fine, I'm fine. Just put them there, excellent, excellent. Thank you, dear, you are a blessing. You are a blessing. All righty, should we start the tape rolling and get started? We are in uh, uh, Nehemiah, and uh, last week we began to enter into the third chapter, and we saw the theme of the chapter is um, the rebuilding of the walls and of Jerusalem and the gates that uh, allow people into that particular wall around Jerusalem, and they named a lot of men, uh, again, uh, that were involved in the work and the order of them that did the work and, and even the order of how the gates uh, and the wall was built. And, and you notice God's order. If you look at your little handout I have there, it started at verse number one with the sheep gate right at the top right. And then it was they built the tower of Mia and the tower of Hannah Neal. And then they came down. Verse three was the fish gate. And then the old gate and the broad wall and then down to the tower of the furnaces. And if you watch it, it circles all the way around in a counterclockwise manner until it ends the chapter in uh, verse 31 and 32, where it says, After him repaired uh, Malchiah, the goldsmith's son, unto the place of the Nethanims and of the merchants over against the gate Mifkad. And to the going up of the corner and between the going up of the corner unto the sheep gate repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants and the chapter ends. And so it kind of worked a full circle until you're back at the sheep gate. Now, last week we were looking at the practical significance of the reality that in order to do all this work of building and rebuilding, it couldn't be done by one man. It needed a collaborative effort. People needed to build together. If anything is going to be done for God, and God, uh, although he chooses a man like Abraham, but then he allows Abraham to have a family and a son and another son and lots of sons, and he builds up, and the work was done together. God does not work through lone rangers. He works uh, together. The body of Christ has many parts. And in the New Testament, he's working with the body of Christ. In the Old Testament, he worked with the Jews, and they were building together. And we saw the importance of building together. And that's a good a practical lesson for, for us to un understand. And so here, as we look at, we look at this uh, diagram here, and of course the, the words of the chapter is, is the importance of the practical aspect of building together. But as I was studying it, I looked very carefully and I noticed there was not only just a meaning to some of the people's names, and we looked at that last week, and again, we're not going to redo what we did last week, but I do have a copy of two pages of every single name that's written, beginning with verse 1 and going through the various verses and showing what the Hebrew name means. And those names tell important uh, lessons and stories, too, as God uses a good name as chosen for the purpose of telling a story. And we can look a little deeper at seeing how the grace of God was involved and how the city became very fragrant to the Lord and how it was strong and how there were friends working together. And the Lord blesses and the Lord gives light and God delivers when the righteous are patient and they work together. And you find all these things in the names in there. But another thing I observed is the very gates themselves tell a very important story. And I wanted to take a look tonight. I titled tonight's a message. And by the way, I do have a, a sheet here that I'll give to you afterwards if you want. And it's called uh, The Spiritual Keys to Jerusalem's Gates. So let's take a look and see how even in the building of this wall, God shows a portrait of the work that he's been doing through the centuries and the work he does in each and every generation and in each and every individual's life. So it all begins in verse 1. And of course, Eliashib the high priest is there. And he rises up with his brethren, the priests, and they builded the sheep gate and they sanctified it. In court, that's making it holy, setting it apart in holiness. And it all begins with the sheep gate. And, and we understand in the story of the scriptures doctrinally that the sheep is our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now we, we talk about him as the Lamb of God, and it's true. Um, he behaved as a young lamb, but he did grow up to the full age of 33 and a third, and he was a full-grown adult male when it was time for him to do the work of the Lord. He was like a fully-grown sheep. He was the Ram of Atonement. 
And our salvation begins at the sheep gate. And the work of relationship with God begins at the sheep gate. And anything that God's going to do in terms of the work that He's going to accomplish down here on planet earth is going to begin with the sheep gate. The first thing you have to go through is you have to go through the sheep gate in order to be involved in the building of the city that's holy to God. Whether that city would be one day the future in Israel, whether it was in the past in Israel, or whether it's the present, the body of Christ, or whether it's your individual salvation, the building that God's going to begin with right there in verse 1 is the high priest is going to show you the Ram of Atonement, the Lamb of God, the male sheep that did the work. There's one God, there's one mediator between uh, God and men. It's the man, Christ Jesus, not the baby, not the child. It's the man. He's a sheep. He's an old ram of atonement doing that mighty work on the cross for you. And it all begins at the sheep gate. That's doctrinal. Now, historically, there was a portrait of the sheep gate too. And I want you to look at Psalm 79. And all these uh, references will be given on the handout that uh, will be copied for you later. Right now, we'll just kind of look at them together. Psalm 79. And here Asaph is praying to the Lord, O God, the heathen are coming to thy inheritance and, and they've laid and shed blood around Jerusalem and uh, they've devoured uh, Jacob. And then he says in verse 9, Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of thy name. Uh, deliver us, purge away our sins for thy name's sake. I mean, here we are back at the sheep gate and the reality is God is our Savior through Jesus Christ and the work he does is one of a purging of sin and he does it for the glory of his name. That's why we are Christians. That's why we have the gospel of Jesus Christ, not of the local church, not of the invisible church, but the gospels of Jesus Christ. And, and he goes through here and then he says, uh, verse 13, so we, thy people, and the sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Now, if you're a good Bible student and reader, the, the people and the sheep of the pasture are, are not the church. It's the Jews. Look at the next verse, Psalm 80, verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock. Thou that dwellest between the cherubim and shine forth between Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. He's talking about Israel. So, so doctrinally, the sheep gate represents Jesus Christ, but historically, the sheep gate represents the nation Israel. Again, we're, we're modern Christians. We're taught kind of wrong. We're a self-centered uh, theology. How's it apply to me? What about me? I heard uh, someone at a Bible study recently, we're talking about the book of Revelation and the saints and, and, and the saints and we're the saints. And I said, no, we're not the saints. I mean, yes, we are in a New Testament uh, meaning. But if you go back to the Old Testament, the saints is a term used for God's people, Israel. And they're the true olive tree. And we're saints that are grafted in to the real olive tree. They're the saints. I'm not sure we're going to do any fighting in the book of Revelation. Psalm 149 says, His saints, the Jews, do the fighting in, in the book of Revelation, not us. So anyways, my point is this. We often look at every term as it applies to us. It does secondarily apply to us, but primarily saints and sheep is for the Jews. And Jesus came as the shepherd of Israel, like it says here. Now, I just want you to think this because it's going to make some sense as we're moving through these gates. The sheep gate, doctrinally, our Lord. Historically, it's Israel. Okay, spiritually, it might be us. But that's a third interpretation. Let's stay with the primary two. So now let's get back to where we are in our studies. And as we're in the book of Nehemiah, as they're building, first they build the sheep gate. And then in Nehemiah chapter 3, i got to catch up to you again because we're going to be flipping through the Bible a lot. It talks about the high priest working and the priests are working and, and verse 2, and next to him builded the men of Jericho and unto them builded Zakor, the son of Imri. And all these people are involved working around the wall and the sheep gate. And then verse 3, but the fish gate did the sons of Hassaniah build who also laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof and the bars thereof, and next to them repaired Maramoth, the son of Arijah. And we have another bunch of people working on the fish gate. Now, doctrinally, remember, our Lord is the sheep. 
and doctrinally fishing is our labor and no sooner than somebody gets to the Lord the next thing he does with them is make them fishers of men and one of the things that usually up is as soon as someone comes through the sheep gate and gets the salvation of Jesus Christ he wants to run right out the fish gate and tell oh I don't know his best friend his mother his father somebody close to them about Jesus Christ and so doctrinally the sheep is the Lord and the fish gate is the place of our labor for the Lord now interestingly here the historical truth is just like the sheep gate represents Israel as the sheep the fish represent the church go to John chapter 20 and yes we're sheep but we are fish who've been fished out of the waters make it John 21 excuse me John 21 John chapter 21 And here's Jesus after his resurrection and Peter and the boys, they go out fishing and Jesus sees them. He stands on the shore and he says in verse five, children, have you any meat? And they answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side and ye shall find. They cast therefore and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. All right. Now if you've got a Bible, it has two testaments. And if you open it to the two testaments, which testament is in your left hand and which is in your right hand? The Old Testament's in your left, the New Testament's in your right. Jesus told those Jewish men who were out there, let's say spiritually, using Old Testament passages, look, you've got you to gotta work on the right side. You've got to work with the New Testament. This is the greater testament. You want to catch fish, you're going to have to go forward with the New Testament. When we're out there on the street, it doesn't make any sense for me to preach Leviticus and, and, uh, and Deuteronomy and uh, Zephaniah to those people. They need to hear the Gospel of John. They need to hear Romans. They need to hear Ephesians. They need to hear Thessalonians. They need to hear the New Testament epistles that tell of the grace of Jesus Christ. So historically, the sheep represents Israel coming in. The fish gate represents the church coming in because we're fished out of the waters and we're brought in and it says and they were not able to draw for the multitude of fishes and they brought all those fishes in and the, and the net did not break uh, they caught uh, verse 11 Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land of great fishes 153 there were so many and yet was not the net broken when, when done the right way with the gospel of Jesus Christ using New Testament scripture, it's a full salvation. It's a total salvation. It's an eternal salvation. You know, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation. That's a problem people don't understand today. Can I lose my salvation? Not if it's eternal. It's not temporal salvation. It's not eternal probation till you make the next mistake and I'm going to throw you out. It's eternal salvation. Say it's too good to be true. Yeah, precisely. That's what God in the Bible is about. We're talking about a God that's almost too good to be true. So why don't you come to him? The goodness of God will lead you to salvation. The goodness that's too good to be true, but it is true, will lead you to salvation. And so the sheep gate and the fish gate. Now go back to where we are in Nehemiah because we want to get through all 10 of these gates in the time that we have because it's a beautiful portrait. And then in verse 6, begins a passage moreover the old gate and it talks about a number of men that were involved in repairing it the Jehoiada and, and Meshulam and uh, verse uh, uh, 7 uh, Malatiah and Jadon and the men of Gibeon and Mitzpah and it talks about that we're repairing this gate all the way unto the throne of the governor and uh, verse 8 there was a man named Uziel there were goldsmiths involved in it uh, there was a man named Hananiah uh, bringing one of the apothecaries. And then there's the first time in the chapter the name Jerusalem. And there's the word Jerusalem. And this is the city we're talking about. And it's mentioned for the first time in the chapter in this paragraph about the old gate. And then it, go, it goes on uh, and he says uh, in uh, verse 9, And next to them repaired uh, Rephaiah, the son of Hur. By the way, that would be Ben-Hur. Ben is son. So there's where they got the term Ben-Hur right out of that. 
Ben Ben Hor, and Hor means a light, and and the son of Hor, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. And then it goes on, and and it says a verse, and there it is again, and and verse ten. Then there's Jedaiah, and there's a man named Hatush, and verse eleven, there's a man named Melchijah and Hashab, and they're continuing to do work under the tower of the furnaces. And then it finally ends this paragraph, and and unto him repaired Shalem, the son of Halohesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. So the third time I get the word Jerusalem. This is the only time it'll appear in the chapter, is in these seven verses about the old gate. Now, historically, the old gate, if you look at your map and look where it's located, if you were sitting at that old gate and you were looking out that old gate, you know which direction you'd be looking at? You'd be looking at the west. And Jerusalem is high, and you're looking out the west, and you can see over the Mediterranean Sea on the horizon and you can see the sun when it is setting, when it's going down. And Jesus said to them, and he was talking to them one in Matthew chapter 16 about uh, some of their habits. And in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 1, he says to them, verse 2, he answered and said, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And verse 3, in the morning it will be fall weather. And, and he's talking to the Pharisees, calling them hypocrites. But the point he's saying is you can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the sign of the times. And one of the things they did know is those old men would sit there, and, and as they're getting old and their life is hard, they're looking for the good days and they're looking to the west for the good days. And you remember when I taught you that passage, the passage is the setting of the sun represents the, the Lord Jesus Christ has its evening and he's dying on the cross and the sun goes down and he pays for our sin and that's the evening and during the evening he's not here anymore he's in heaven and the moon gives the light for him and the church represents the moon and we get we don't shine on our own we receive the light of Jesus Christ and we shine it to the dark world in the evening of the period while he's still sitting in heaven until he returns but in the morning when he returns it's also going to be a red sky. Now, it was red in the evening with his blood, but in the morning it's to be red with their blood, and that's the second coming. And he was trying to tell them the difference between the first and the second coming. And the old men used to look for that first coming, and they were sitting there looking to the west, and they're thinking about the, the first coming of their Messiah. They had a heart. There was a man in Luke 1 and 2 named Simeon, and he was waiting for that coming. He was so excited. He knew that Messiah was going to come. And he thanked the Lord for the opportunity to see him. The old men. Um, go, go to uh, Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. The Lord is telling the prophet Jeremiah the lamentations that he has for his nation because of the errors that they made, the errors that they have um, committed two evils they've forsaken me the fountain of living water and they viewed out cisterns broken cisterns that cannot hold water and he says my fear is not in them anymore and and what he finally tells um jeremiah well two chapters no five verse five and then six sixteen first five five and Jeremiah just recognizes, you know, these people today that are leading, they're poor and they're foolish and they don't know the way of the Lord, he says in verse 4, nor the judgment of their God. Boy, if, if that doesn't sound like Christianity today, they, they don't know the way of the Lord. They don't know the judgment of their God. I can't tell you how many times I'm just frustrated listening to a Christian radio and television when questions come in and they can't give a straight answer. They don't know. Why do they not know the judgment of their God? What, 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 what's going on here? I mean, this is what you do for a living. There's one guy, he'll be on tomorrow morning. He, he's out of Florida. Key life. He, I call him deep throat because he's got a deep voice. This guy doesn't know anything about the Bible. And he's a professor in a seminary. And tomorrow he'll answer questions at 830. If you want to hear a guy answer questions that can't answer questions, it's a good thing he prays for 10 minutes. Otherwise, he'd have to answer questions for longer. I, I, I tell him, keep praying, keep praying. So you don't have to answer a question. He doesn't know the judgment of the Lord. What's going on in Christianity today? Well, well, here's what uh, Jeremiah said. Verse 5, I'm going to get me to the great men. I'm going to speak to them that have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God. Who are they? Well, 616. That's who they are. 
Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the old ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. And those few old men that had a humble heart, that had walked with the Lord, and had listened to the Lord, those were the ones that they needed to go to. So, so historically, it was the gathering place of the old men. But if you go back and you look at that chapter carefully, Nehemiah 3, it's only in those three verses is the word Jerusalem found. And in verse 9 and in verse 11, or no, verse 12, it talks about the half part of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is an interesting word. It's the place where God chose to put his name. And I've showed you this many times, only in English. But if you take the word Jerusalem, it's nine letters. By the way, so is the, the phrase Holy Bible, nine letters. And there's two words that found in there. There's J-A-M-E-S-R-U-L-E, -E, rule. James rule or the rule of James. Jesus said, Jerusalem is the city of the great king. That would be the great King James is the rule. And it's seven verses. And it took seven years to write the King James Bible. It was purified seven times, just like God said. It's a portrait, and one half of it came from Hebrew, and one half of it came from Greek. And together, it was the third giving of God's Word. He had gave it once in Hebrew, once in Greek, only half and half, and now the whole thing in English. And it's a portrait of the old gate is the old book. Now, what you're going to see on my drawing here is between gates, uh, the sheep and the fish gate, there's a line. Because the line represents the majority of people never find the old gate. And I mean Christians. They get saved. They may even do a little bit of fishing, but they never find the old gate. And like we're learning in the book of Luke, that's the difference between a Christian and a disciple. And, and there is a big difference between the two of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, God has few disciples. Matter of fact, I was showing my son a verse uh, yesterday. I don't know if you want to look at it. It's in Daniel chapter 7. And it's a prophecy of the future when God the Father finally gives all the kingdoms to his son. When the Ancient of Days finally brings the Son of Man before him. And then he gives to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And in that particular chapter... And in that vision that's given Daniel, which will be fulfilled soon, it says in verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne like the fiery flame, his wheels as a burning fire, and a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Now watch these phrases. Thousand thousands ministered to him, comma, and... 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. And we're going to see later on how there's a gate of judgment that's going to be found here because judgment is going to happen one day and we will we'll all stand before God and give account and judgment for our life. Not just lost people, saved people too. But I thought it was most interesting in that portrait in those phrases, thousand thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. Now, if you're a math person, a thousand times a thousand is a million. And 10,000 times 10,000 is a hundred million. And if you look at the phrase very carefully, how many get to minister to God and get close to him? Well, look at it. A million. And how many don't get close to him in ministry? They just get to stand in the congregation somewhere. That's a hundred million. So what's God telling you? He's saying when it all shakes up and winds down, of all the people I've saved, maybe one out of a hundred really served me as a disciple, and they're going to get to come close to me and minister. And when I set up the New Jerusalem, which is 1,500 miles from this way to that way, and 1,500 miles that way, and I'm in the center of it, and there's 750 miles there, and 750, and 750 there, and 70 there, there's going to be some people that live close to me, and some people live in 700 miles away. They're still in heaven, but they're 700 miles away. Why? They... 
they weren't interested in discipleship. I saved them. I love them. They're my children. They just didn't want to serve. They didn't want to be disciples. So enjoy heaven at 750 miles away from me, and you can come see me once in a while. And these other ones get to be close to me. Even, in, even with the disciples, you know some were closer than others, don't you? Who was, who was always with the Lord? Peter, James, and John. Where was Thomas sometimes? I don't know. It's 7-Eleven. Tim Hortons? I, I don't know. He slipped off and did something? I, I don't know. And God's showing you there is an order. God is a God of order. And there's rank and order. Now, how it turns out that way, I imagine if you pray hard and ask hard, maybe God will move you up the ranks, but you've got to want to do it. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. John 8.31. If, how many do? Talking to a Christian just the other day, first time ever got in touch with me, we started talking back and forth, and I said, you know, you want to read through, he's been saved 30 years, never read through the Bible once. He's not the exception, he's the rule. But I encourage him, I said, would, would you like to start on a reading program? Would you like me to help you start on a reading program? So you can get through that book, you can at least get an A in a reading. So when you stand before the Lord, he can at least say, well, at least you read your Bible once. Do you know how many are going to be standing there going, I never knew there was a prophet named Habakkuk. I didn't know there was such a book. I, I there's going to be so much confusion. Okay, back to where we are. So the old gate wasn't just the gathering place of the old men. It's the men that knew God. And they knew God because they knew which book was God's. And they not only knew it, it didn't sit on their shelf. They knew it intimately and personally. That's the old gate. Now, here's what happens if you have the old gate. Let's continue on our studies. The next gate you're going to find is verse 13, the valley gate. The valley gate. Now, if you look at your map here, again, your little drawing, the valley gate is found down on the left-hand side uh, opposite that old gate down on the bottom where the old gate's up on the top. That valley gate from a directional standpoint would lead to the city of Gath. There was a giant in Gath. It's a valley gate. There, there are valleys over on that side. There, the valleys in the Bible, there's the valley of Achor. That's a valley of trouble. There's the valley of Beth Peor. That's the valley of an opening and letting something in that you might not want to let in. There's the valley of Eschol, a cluster of grapes. There's the valley of Gerar. That's a circle. There's the valley of Moab. And we know about the Moabites, and Moab is a compound word meaning the water of a father. There's the valley of Zered, the willow bush. Let me give you an idea what, what he's saying with all these valleys. Go to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. What does this, what's this a picture of, the valley gate? Numbers chapter 14. Verse 25, now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. The valley gate is a picture of when one of us goes back into sin and into the valley of trouble like Achor, the valley of the cluster of grapes like like alcohol. The valley of Moab, that's family problems and the family pulling you away from the Lord and getting you uh, away from God. Out in the valley, the valley of uh, the opening where you're opening your ears to other teachings and other things and other winds and other doctrines and maybe the teachings of the world and you're getting in those things and you're getting sucked into that valley. That's the valley gate. That's a real problem. That, that Christians struggle with. Over there in Gath where the giants are and they intimidate and they trouble and you're stuck in that valley, the valley of Gerar where you're just walking around in circles like a hamster uh, uh, and, a, and a sheep doesn't know what he's doing, just going round and round and round making the same mistakes over and over. And what God wants you to do is get out of that valley 
and come through the gate and come back into the holy city. But you, you go out through the valley gate, but you don't come back in that way. You come in through the next one. Now go back to where we are in, in Nehemiah chapter 3. You go out in verse 13. 13 is an unlucky number. And you go in a wrong direction and you're out the valley gate. And when you come back, you've got to come back through verse 14, which is the dung gate. Of course, of course in, in the book of Exodus, i just read a passage in Exodus chapter 29 and verse 14. And God is giving the directions to them and this shalt thou do to hallow these things Aaron and his sons must do this and they must do that and then he says in verse 14 but the flesh of the bullock when they're making the offering and his skin and his dung thou shalt burn with fire without the camp and one of the things you got to do when you come back through the dung gate is now you got to get that stuff and you got to burn it and you got to get rid of it and this is the sin that has to be unloaded and the filth and the mire that comes when you're out there in the valley and getting all mucked up and you come back. Now remember the prodigal son? And he came back from that far country? I don't know when the last time he bathed. I don't know when the last time he changed his clothes. He might have had the same clothes for the last three months because he lost all his money. He probably came back muddy and dirty and he came in and he was and there was the father waiting for him. But the father's got a work to do. And getting all that stuff out, Paul says, I got to put that behind me. I got to count it like dung and get rid of it. And after you've been in the valley, you got to come back through that dung gate. And then, of course, what's going to happen is the very next verse 15. There's going to be the gate of the fountain. The gate of the fountain, which is, end of the verse, by the pool of Siloam, by the king's gardens, under the stairs that are connected to David. And in the fountain in the Bible talks about when you come back and you get rid of that stuff in the dung gate, what's going to happen? Go to Proverbs, a couple verses. We'll look at Proverbs 13. These are the spiritual keys to Jerusalem's gates. And what they really mean is God's building it. Proverbs 13, the fountain gate. Verse 14, the law of the wise is a fountain of life. You just come out of that valley gate departing, come out of that dung gate from the snares of death that are out there in the valley with all the refuse. Um, the fountain of life. Go to the next chapter, 14, verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Jesus Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And that abundant life is at the fountain and that life is separated from sin. It's far from the snares of death. And this, this modern Christ that they preach, this buddy-buddy that goes down to the beer hall and hangs out, he doesn't do that. He never did that. Jesus Christ, Christ was a preacher of righteousness. He would say, come unto me. Yes, he might go to a person's house and he would preach to them and then he would begin to move and they had one of two choices. Follow him and leave their filth behind because he wasn't sitting down with them a second time and he's moving on and he's going down the path of righteousness departing from the snares of death and departing from the sin and departing from the valley and departing from the dung, going on to the fountain of life. Um, Jeremiah, we were just in there. On a, we're going to go to John, but stop at Jeremiah on the way. Jeremiah 2. This is one of the problems that got them in the valley and the dung. Jeremiah 2, verse 13. He's going to get everything out at the dung gate and now you're going to be at the gate of the fountain, the fountain of life, the fountain of living waters. And here's the problem, 2.13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. I, I, I don't know what happened in Christianity. I mean, I've read the history of it about what happened in the 1800s and listening to the lying scholars, uh, the, probably the greatest enemies 
for the Christian is a Christian scholar. Is your biggest enemy. He's a scribe. He's a Sadducee of today. You don't want to trust Christian scholars. They're the ones that came up with these translation committees and these Bibles. Read about it in the 1800s. Those are the guys that started disbelieving the Bible. They, they forsook the fountain of living waters in this book. And they started to you out cisterns, broken cisterns that don't hold water. And they came out with the RV and the RSV and the ASV and all this panoply of Bibles. Hey, folks, been 50 years with everybody having their own Bible. How's the church doing? What's it witness to the world? What's its power? What revival are you seeing? And God wants them at the fountain of life, at the fountain of living waters. And, and you know what attends that fountain? Go to John chapter 7. That gate of the fountain of life, the f which, is, which is the law of the Lord. It's the fear of the Lord. And you know what attends that? It's John chapter 7. Jesus, uh, verse 37, was at the Feast of um, Tabernacles. And at the last day, they would have this big ceremony where they come in with uh, barrels of water and pour it. To, to remind them of the time when the water was brought forth from the rock in the wilderness, when they tabernacled in the wilderness. And Jesus is watching them go through this big uh, traditional ceremony. And uh, Jesus stood and cried, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, the fountain of living waters. What's he speaking of? He's speaking of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost attends this book. And when you when you come out of the, uh, the come through the dung gate and leave all that stuff behind and come to the gate of the fountain, then the Holy Ghost will begin to work in your life. And verse twenty six will be the next gate, and it's the water gate. And here you'll be right at the water of the Word of God, and the Holy Ghost plus the Holy Scriptures flowing together into one stream of truth. There are four, three things called truth in the Bible. Of course, Jesus, I am the way, I am the truth. But then once he left, the two things left behind that are truth are the scriptures. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. That's a physical truth, a physical fountain of water. And the spirit of truth, 1 John chapter 5. And, and those two work together. Just as Jesus was a physical and spiritual being, he had the fullness of, of the Godhead in him, he was the Word with a capital W with the Word, a little W inside of him. When he left, he's now left us with a, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures. And the fountain gate and the water gate flow together when someone finally comes back out of the valley puts everything behind at the dung gate and they come to that gate of the fountain and the water gate and God begins to not only cleanse them and their soul and their spirit and their body and prepares them and fills them like he did at Pentecost for, for a purpose. And what's that going to be? Verse 28 back in where we are in Nehemiah. It's going to be the next gate as we're completing this loop here. And so we've come through the uh, fountain gate and through the water gate. And the next gate we're going to go to is verse 28. As it's in our text of Nehemiah 3. And here comes the horse gate. And the horse gate is the next gate. Now what's that a picture of? Well, I have to go back in the scriptures and look at a few places. I guess maybe... Uh, there's three places you want to look. So if you want to go in order, you can get your finger in Job chapter 39 and Zechariah 10. Job 39 and Zechariah 10. Zechariah is the second last book of the Old Testament just before Matthew. And in Zechariah 10, if you just grab to take a look at uh, verse 3. Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. And this is the Lord uh, uh, talking about when he sends the latter rain at the end of the tribulation, and he punishes all the false shepherds, and he punishes the goats. 
And he said, when I divide the nations, the goats will be on my left hand. They're the ones that treated my nation wrong. And he, he punishes the goats. And then he says, for the Lord hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Go to Job 39. Job 39 and start around verse 19. And God is speaking now. He's asking questions of Job. And he says to Job, Hast thou given the horse strength? Because horses are strong. Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? They have that big, thick, powerful neck. They can, you can't turn them. They can go straight ahead. Can, can you make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley. He rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet our men. He mocketh at fear. He's not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him. The glittering spear and the shield. He swalloweth the ground with his fierceness and rage. Neither he believeth thee that it's the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, Ha, ha, he smelleth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. What's he saying? Well, after you spend time, you get the dung out. You spend time at the gate of the fountain with the Holy Ghost. You spend time at the water gate. You know what God's going to make you? A soldier in his army. He's going to send you out to do battle on his behalf. You're going to fight the good fight of fight, faith. After God has spent some time with you at the fountain and at the water gate, he's going to use you. You know, today people want a sunny Christianity. You know, you know there's an area on earth that gets nothing but sun. You know what it's called? A desert. It's dry and dusty and good for nothing. You need a balanced, real Christianity. You need the Lord is a man of war, Exodus 15, 3. He calls us out by his armies. We, we are soldiers of Jesus Christ to endure hardness and to go out there. And we're going to have to go through some battles. And he's going to send us out the horse gate right back into the valley to fight, clothed with strength and ready to do battle for his name and for his gospel and for his church. That's what the horse, Revelation 19, you know the passage. When heaven is opened, Revelation chapter 19, the testimony of Jesus Christ, the spirit of prophecy. These are the true sayings of God. Verse 11, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in his righteousness, he doth judge and make war. You say that's future. Hey, that's right now, folks. Spiritually, that's right now. If you're a servant and a soldier of Jesus Christ, you've got to judge. You have to judge between the good and the bad, between the true and the false, between, between right doctrine and error. And then you've got to make war against that which is false. You've got to take a stand. You've got to preach against the sin. Not just the, the sins of the flesh, the sins of the mind and the sins of the spirit and the imaginations that take captive men's minds and let them know, hey, that, that religious garbage, the, your author didn't do that. Your Savior didn't do that. He came in simplicity. And He gave you a perfect salvation. And He gave you a perfect book. And He gave you a perfect way to know Him. And all Scripture has been given by the inspiration of God that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished. In other words, he's furnished with, with everything you need. And with that furnishment, you can go out and you can serve him. He's going to put you out the horse gate. There's only two gates left. Let's go back to where we are. So we see, as the Lord begins to do this work, if you meet the Lord at the sheep gate, and you do some fishing at the fishing gate, and you'll come to the old gate, and you'll get a hold of the old paths and the old book. By the way, there's no new thing under the sun. Do you understand? There's no truth in the news. And there's no news in the truth. There's a gospel in here. Not news. If it's new, it ain't true. If it's true, it ain't new. It's been settled in heaven forever. I, I, you know, you can watch the news for entertainment purposes, but you don't have to worry about it. Everything they're talking about is going to pass away and be destroyed by the Lord himself. The only thing that's going to be saved are souls. That's all he's interested in. 
God so loved the world, He didn't try and fix it from the poverty problems. He didn't try and fix it from the disease problems. He didn't try and fix it from the social problems or the environmental problems. The greatest problem was sin. So He gave His Son that He would die on a cross, and whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. And the issue is sin and salvation, and that's what Jesus talked about. The divine teacher in John 3, right to the heart of the matter, you must be born again. Didn't waste time with anything else. So as you work your way through, you get to that old gate. Uh, you may fall into a valley quickly, but God's going to bring you back in there and clean you up at the dung gate and then bring you to the fountain and the water gate. And if you're willing to get out of the valley and come back and empty the refuse out at the dung gate and spend time at the fountain and water gate, God's going to put you at the horse gate and send you out to do battle on his behalf. The, the harvest is plenteous. We're just driving around Buffalo today looking at the houses that need the gospel. You just, how many in the car? Just a few of us thinking, how are we going to do this? You know what the problem is? The laborers are few. God likes some men to mount up and go out and, and, and judge when a soul is lost. As opposed to, I didn't know if he's lost. And I never thought about it. You, you never thought whether that person's lost? You haven't concerned about his soul? That's the most precious thing he has, Jesus says. You're worried about what? If he's got 20 bucks in his pocket? Who cares if he's got 20 bucks or 20,000 bucks? If he had 20 million and didn't have Jesus Christ, he, he's poor and wretched and miserable and naked and blind in God's eyes. He'll send you out the horse gate. Now go back to where we are, to two last gates. And then finally, the horse gates in verse 28. And verse 29, After them repaired Zadok, the son of Immer, over against his house, and uh, repaired also Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate. Uh, Zadok, righteousness. Uh, Shemaiah, the Lord, is renowned. Shechaniah, the Lord, is my neighbor. Immer, one who's prominent and is willing to, to talk and to open his mouth about truth. And they're at the eastern gate. What's the eastern gate a picture of? Well, well, doctrinally, you'd have to go to Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezekiel 44. The east gate. We'll make it. We're just going to make it. Two more gates here. Verse 1. And here the Lord is, is showing Ezekiel a portrait and a picture of the temple that his son Jesus will build for the millennium. And he says, verse 1, Then he brought me back by the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary that looketh toward the east, and it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be open. No man shall enter in it, because the Lord God of Israel hath entered in by it. Therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince. The prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the porch of that gate, and shall go out by the way of the same. And that east gate, now historically it was used by the prince. Take a look at it on your map and see how it's located there. And that particular east gate led you right to the temple. And the, and the entry door and the pillars were right at the east. And you entered into the court, and then you entered from the court into the holy place. And if you kept going east past the veil, westward, uh, coming from east to west, you went right into the holy of holies. And historically, that's the way God set the temple up. And doctrinally, that's how he's going to set it up so that when his son comes back, He's going to go right through that east gate and enter into the temple himself, as we just read there. But, in addition to that, what does it mean for us spiritually? What is the spiritual key to it? Well, stay in Ezekiel, go a couple chapters to the right, go chapter 46. And what's the spiritual picture of the east gate for us? Well, we go out in battle. At the horse gate, we come back through the east gate, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, the gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened. And in the day of the new moon it shall be opened. 
And the prince shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate without and shall stand by the post of the gate. And the priests shall prepare burnt offerings and his peace offerings. And he shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go forth, but the gate shall not be shut until the evening. Likewise, the people of the door shall worship at the door of this gate before the Lord in the Sabbaths and in the new moons and the burnt offering the priest shall offer. So with that gate is open, not just for the prince, then it's open for the people to come and worship. What's the East gate a picture of? The Eastern gate is a picture of us coming together as an assembly to worship the Lord. After we go out and battle during the week, we come on our Sabbath, if you will. I know the Sabbath technically is a seventh day, but our Sabbath is the worship day of celebrating our Savior, Jesus Christ, on Sunday when the church would gather together. And we come in through the East Gate and we gather together. And God expects that. And this idea of people that, all these people talk about the universal church and the invisible church because they're from another universe and they want to be invisible when it's time for church service. I mean, you can't, we can't show up. We can't come through the East Gate to worship our Savior one day a week. We're too busy with other activities. And, and there's no activity. If you love mother or father more than me, well, it's somebody's birthday. I don't care whose birthday it is. Well, we're having a party. I don't care whose party it is. I'm coming through the East Gate on this day with the prince to worship. He's here. You know, he's faithful. You know, where two or three gather, you know, Jesus shows up in the midst. If he's going to be here, we ought to be here too. He's not at the birthday party. And the Eastern Gate is a picture of this. We gather as we wait. Let me show you a couple more passages. People, they, 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 they gloss over this like it's not important. It is important to the Lord. You're going to see because we're going to get to the gate Mifkad next. That's the final gate. But in Deuteronomy chapter 16, here's what God said. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 16, make sure I got the, the right verse here. There was a better one than Deuteronomy 16. It might have been 11. It might be 6. Let me see if it's back in 6. 16 verse 16 commanded them to come three times in the year before them. And I'll find uh, the other one. But, but he did say to them that you are to assemble in the place that God hath chosen. And 16.16 16 says that. And there's a better verse. I'll get it on my, uh, again, in all the writings I do, I, I make some errors. That's what happens. But let me show you a good one. Hebrews 10, verse 25, and I'm sure you've heard it. Hebrews 10.25 Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so the much more as you see the day approaching. And through the Eastern Gate we come, we've just been out there in battle, and every time we come we're one day closer to the return of the Lord and we're exhorting one another. Now the final gate is found in verse 31. And after him repaired Micaiah, the goldsmith's son, unto the place of the Nethanims and of the merchants over against the uh, gate Mifkad to the going up to the corner. Now, the Nethanims were people who wanted to help the priests. They weren't Levites technically. Some of them weren't even Jews technically. There were people like Obed the Edomite that came and wanted to serve they wanted to serve the God of Israel, kind of like the Queen of Sheba. She heard about the God of Israel. She wanted to come ask. I mean, these are nothingims that want to be a part of what's going on. There are other people being brought in. There's, he talks about goldsmith. He talks about merchants. But then he mentions this name, Mifkad. What is Mifkad? Well, I had to look at this, and, and, and it is an Old Testament, and he is speaking to Jews, and I had to look at the Hebrew on this, and there are two things that the word mifkad in Hebrew is translated two times in the Bible, where it's actually translated into another word. The first one is in First Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles 21. 
And it's at one time when David was trying to get the number of all the mighty men that he had in Israel and the people of Israel. And in verse 5, after Joab ran around and, and gathered the people and the numbers from each district, it says, And Joab gave the sum of the Mifkab, the number of the people, unto David. So Mifkad number one can mean number. But it's also translated in one other place uh, that the word Mifkad is translated into an English word and it's found in Ezekiel chapter 43. And then we'll put it together. We'll put one plus two together and we'll get the understanding. Here are the little, there a little. Ezekiel uh, 43 and verse 21. And thou shalt take the bullock of the sin offering, and this is they're doing the offerings in the millennium, and, and burn it at the appointed, there's Mifkad, place of the house. So number one, it's number, and number two, it's appointed. So this was a place, actually, the gate Mifkad was a place where they would take the men that had come in through the horse gate, they would take the mighty men, they would take all those people to an appointed place and they would number them and they would rank them. I know something that's appointed. It's appointed unto men once to die. And then after this, the judgment. And the Lord will write up the number, it says, of the people. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. The gate Mifkad talks about the very end. It's the judgment. When you run that full race from the sheep gate all the way around, there's a day when we're done worshiping down here when we're going to the gate Mifkad. And he's going to bring the people after appointed unto us Mifkad to die and then the judgment at the appointed place. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now we know we know there's many places that discuss this, but here's what's going to happen. Mifkad. I, I don't understand the word. You know who understands it perfectly? Jesus. He has the perfect understanding. You know how perfect his understanding is? First Corinthians chapter four. Look at verses four and five. Paul says the truth is verse 3, he says, I judge not mine own self. Verse 4, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified? I mean, I know I'm saved. But beyond my justification, in terms of my sanctification, my service, he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time, before the Mifkad, the appointed time, until the Lord come, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. I mean, we're going to stand before the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, in the next book, that he writes the Corinthians and verse 10. And before we get to that judgment in verse 10, he says, verse 9, wherefore we labor. I mean, we better be going out the horse gate and doing the work. We better be coming through the eastern gate and doing the worship. Worship and work is something God expects out of us. We better be at the fountain and the water gate getting the word, the word. The worship, the work, that's the fullness of a Christian life. Well, one day, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, uh, uh, 5, verse 10, we must all appear, talking to Christians, that's who the book of Corinthians is written to, brothers and sisters in the Lord, believers must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body after his salvation. How did you use that body? Did you offer it a living sacrifice to the Lord? Did you get out of the valley gate? Did you get rid of the dung at the dung gate? Did you go to the fountain gate? Did you get the old gate? Did you spend some time going through the horse gate and serving? Say, I can't go out and serve. Hey, you can get on your knees. You can pray for those that are. That's the way you can serve. And one day you'll be at the gate Mifkad at the appointed place for the judgment. And then it all comes back to the sheep gate right up to the top, and it runs full circle. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the ending, the whole thing runs around. Those are the spiritual keys to the gates of Jerusalem. Any thoughts or comments on what we looked at? Yes, brother. Pastor 
You know, there is um, when you talk to an Orthodox, you're talking an Orthodox Jew today. You're talking a rabbinical Jew. You're talking those guys that you see walking around on Fridays with the hats and everything. According to the Bible, uh, you're in Second Corinthians. You'd have to go to um, uh, chapter three in Second Corinthians, and you got to understand that verse fifteen. Even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. God judicially has blinded them. That's what the parables were about. That's the judicial blinding, partial blindness given to the nation Israel because they refused their Messiah. So do they know this stuff? I don't know what they know. They probably know much at all. Because the Spirit of God's not talking to them. But but it says if 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 their heart would ever turn to Christ, well then then you know verse sixteen when it that's their heart would turn to the Lord then the veil will be taken away. But if they won't turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, God's not going to give them understanding. So they read an Old Testament they don't know it they don't understand until they're willing to turn to the Messiah. He said, "You will not come to me that you might have life." You like to mess around with the book. The book can't give you life unless the book is testifying of me and you receive that testimony that my father wrote. And then at that point, that book will open up to you. The Spirit of God will open it up. But without that, your mind will be completely confused. It'll be a maze. You won't know what you're looking at. And they don't. But for those of us that are saved, we got no excuse. These are the spiritual keys for those born of the Spirit. Father, thank you for the portrait given here. It's a great chapter. It was exciting for me to learn it. I hope I presented it okay. I don't know if I did, but it was a blessing to me. Thank you for the the new city you're building, Lord. Help us to get to the sheep gate and to run the circuit so one day when we're at the gate Mifkad, we'll hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen.